Rachel's offness. We're back together. You and I, we're doing a new show. This is Dr. Rachel Zoffness. She is a UCSF assistant clinical professor and a visiting professor at Stanford in pain and health psychology, which is cool. You've been on the show like five, this is the fifth time? I think it's the fifth time. So I figure, I have this rule. When you're on more than four times, (laughs) we name it a show and we do it monthly. What do you think? I am so down. And I'm thinking we call it pain points with Z squared or Dr. Z and Dr. Z or Z and Z. I think those all sound like great ideas. And I think we got some of those ideas from some of your fans. That's correct, yeah. because we put out a call, right? We're like, we're gonna do the show, we're gonna talk about pain, we're talking about uh, mental health, we're gonna talk about health and the biopsychosocial integration of the human condition. Yep. And we put it out to supporters and they gave us lots of great questions and we're gonna go through their questions. Totally, and I put out an SOS on Twitter also. And it worked really well, I saw your responses. People had a lot of questions for us. Dude, so many people have messaged me. They're like, man, every time you get Rachel's offness on the show, I learn so much. It validates what I'm going through. There's a lot of suffering in the world, girl. There's a lot of suffering. And what I like about our dynamic is, A, I think we're just aligned psychically and potentially spiritually, whatever that means. I whatever that means, I'm, I'm down for it. Yeah, and, but also having a psychologist and a physician in conversation about health and by health, I mean the brain and the body together mm-hmm. is very rare. It just doesn't happen that often. Yeah. So, so I think it's a unique opportunity to talk through common conditions that happen to humans and to get a physician perspective and a psychology perspective. It's like, oh, brain and body are actually connected 100% of the time. So let's talk about health that way. I love it. And speaking of brain and body connection, I just got my booster Dude. for Moderna. And the reason I did it, I've been hesitating because I'm like, well, I'm relatively not old and I don't, you know, I'm not exposed a lot, but this is what pushed me to get the Moderna booster, which is a half dose booster, was, well, I'm gonna be traveling with mm-hmm. the family for yep. Christmas. I'm gonna see my elderly parents who are vaccinated and boosted. And I also just wanted to figure out what kind of side effects I would get because the second dose kicked my ass. Right, you said that. Right, it was horrible. I had the man flu and all that. So now I'm about 24, almost 24 hours out from the booster. And I have like a little achiness, a little headache, a little bit of brain fogginess, but it ain't bad. Like a little lower energy. A little lower energy, that's it. I'm like low energy Jeb, as Trump used to call Jeb Bush. Oh, wow. Yeah, right? (laughs) He's low energy, he's low energy. You wanna be president? You gotta be high energy, Jeb. I'm trying to rev up my energy <laughs> by channeling Great. Trump. <laughs> I, I got the booster also. I got had no effect from shot one, also mm. Moderna. Mm. No effect from shot two, but the booster. Oh, really? Yeah. Moderna. I was, yeah, I mean, look, I don't wanna over dramatize, but I was like very sweaty and shaky and felt very fevery. I did not take my temperature, but I'm, pretty sure I had a fever and I just piled on lots of layers yeah. and lay on my couch under lots of blankets yeah. and drank lots of tea and like binge watch Netflix. So it was like, and really people fine. don't want to get this vaccine. Why? It's like, that sounds like an ideal <laughs> night. <laughs> like I would pay Except for that. for the sweating, shaking part. Yeah. No, but that stuff is just like, it just adds drama. <laughs> right. I know Netflix and chills. <laughs> ha, ha, you see what I did ha. there? That was funny. This is why we're Dr. That Z and Dr. Fun. Z. We're ZZ Doc. You see what I did there? I do. It was good. I liked it. It's terrible. I'm sorry. Listen, <laughs> Let's take these questions because yeah. they're really good. One of them was like, what? Can we start by saying yeah. a couple of really important things, which is like- <gasps> Right, yeah. some disclaimers. Yeah. So listen, guys, I'm gonna say this right to the cam cam. This is not medical advice. Dr. Rachel is not your doctor. Um, she's not your mom. She's not your sister, okay? She's not in your band. She is here to inform, entertain, and educate. And this is not medical advice. So- Remember that, talk to your own practitioner about these issues. And same for you. And same the for me. The you're giving. But this is all understood because people advice. know I'm a two-bit clown. Okay. And they're like, I'm not gonna listen to anything he says about health, come on. Why isn't he in a Darth Vader costume? That's why I'm here. Exactly. Yeah, like, what, right? Why am I even here? <laughs> we could do the next one in full costume just to satisfy now, people. I like that. And that's the kind of mask that we ought to be wearing if we're trying to prevent Omicron. Because <laughs> we all know that like Omicron, right? So Darth Vader mask. Darth Vader mask. Good. Full red. I have a butterfly mask. I don't think they match. But This sounds like an anime kind of fetish. <laughs> why, why do I suddenly want three of these? In episode six, we're going to be furries. <laughs> <laughs> in episode six... We're going to be furries. Yeah. That came out of your mouth. It totally You know what? Did. This is a family show. <laughs> Sorry. I'll, it's not. I'll behave. Yeah. It says explicit on iTunes. I think. I don't know what that means. Adult underoos? 
we could real, there's so many options for where this could go. It's so exciting. Well, now that we've done all this, I feel like I need to reestablish our credibility on these topics. Okay. So we've had a few shows yeah. where you have you've really brought to the fore this idea that everything from pain, anxiety, certain physical symptoms, diseases like even hypertension are biopsychosocial, meaning they have biological, physical components, they have psychological, mental components, and they have social components. Yes. So when we answer these questions today, yes. we're gonna we're gonna do it through the lens of this. That's exactly right. Yeah, and um, you're the mistress of this. I almost said master, but that would have been gender normative. I'm fine with either. Okay, really, good. Just you can call me the master of whatever you want. Master of puppets? No, that was a Metallica thing. I'm not a puppet master. Well, you should think about it. Um, but but to your point about uh, the biopsychosocial thing, the thing about human beings and medicine is that in medicine, what we often do is we distill human illnesses and ailments down to the purely biological or biomedical. Mm. So, for example, with pain, which of course I talk about a lot, pain is treated as a purely biomedical, biological problem. And because we frame pain that way, we treat it with purely biological or biomedical solutions like pills and procedures. But A, it's not working. Chronic pain is on the rise. It is not decreasing. And B, we now have an opioid epidemic. And we had, I think, the rates of overdose during the pandemic, oh. originally CDC estimated it was like 38% increase. Now, mm. 50 po 54% mm. increase in opioid overdoses and deaths. So a, a lot of those had nothing to do with pain, by the way. So I don't want to suggest that that's all pain related. However, in general, human beings, and this is something everyone knows, are never purely biomedical. There are a million things going on with human beings all the time. We are very complex. So there are cognitive things. What's happening in your head, what your head is saying to you, affects your body 100% of the time. And I hope we get to that today. Mm -hmm. Emotions affect the body 100% of the time. If you've ever had butterflies in your stomach or sweaty palms or a racing heart when you were anxious, you know that the brain and body are connected 100% of the time when it comes to emotions. There are social and sociological components to health all the time. There's research that shows that when people are isolated and lonely and alone, their cortisol spikes. Cortisol is? A stress hormone. And what does it do to the immune system? It actually suppresses it. It tanks your immune system. Mm -hmm. So lonely people who are lonely and alone, by the by, oftentimes have higher morbidity and mortality rates. Meaning, if you're healthy, you're more likely to get sick. If you're sick, you're more likely to get sicker. And if you're really sick, you're more likely to die if you are lo lonely and isolated and alone. What does it say about human health that we're ignoring the psychosocial components of our wellness? How is anyone supposed to get better if we're only focusing on the bio when we know that health is biological and psychological and social or sociological? So that you're right. I agree that that's a very important frame for every question we get asked. And I'm gonna triple down on that and say during our COVID pandemic, what we've done is focused on the biological and we've destroyed the social and the psychological. I'm gonna triple down. You don't have to agree with me on this, but I'm just gonna say this right now. What we've done is created a pandemic of anxiety, depression, loneliness, hope, hopelessness, fear, and we see it manifest in everything from children to the increased suicide rate and the increased overdose rate. I think it's all a vibrating waveform of this complex holistic truth that we are. And until we can look at that holistic picture, we're never gonna actually do good with public health policies. So that being said, speaking of doing bad. One of the questions we got was, and it was after a recent school shooting, what makes a kid a killer? So how does this happen? Yeah. And I know nothing about this. I know. And, and you and I have spent some time thinking about it because a lot of the questions that we got, like I work with a lot of suicidal teens. Mm. I have never, full transparency, worked with a kid who was homicidal. Mm. So there are a lot of things to say about that. I actually want, can I, can I go big picture before we go? Please. So I just want to say in general, and I've said this before, it is actually normal for human beings in the course of their lives to have suicidal thoughts. And I'm going to say what I mean by that. I'm not saying everybody does, but it is not unusual and in the realm of normal to think things like, things are really bad right now. It would be better if I weren't here. Or gosh, it would be such a relief to not have to deal with all of this emotional and physical pain, I'd rather be dead. Or when you're a teenager and life is going sideways, 
when you're a teenager, things feel really permanent. Like I'll never have a boyfriend, or I'll never get boobs, or like no one will ever ask me That's to a dance. That's how I felt. I'm like, <laughs> when are these gonna come in? <laughs> I, you know, Bobby's got his boobs. Totally. Yeah. Everyone else has training bras. I was like, are you there, Mar? Uh, God, <laughs> it's me, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Sorry, I don't mean to make light of you suicidal You should make light. Th- I, you're not thoughts. making light of suicidal thoughts. You're making light of like teenage angst, which and, is and absolutely man, And man boobs, which are not, the gynecomastia mastia is not funny. Okay, I'm not making fun of that right. either. Just want to make sure. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good. Thank you. So, so th- these thoughts come through and the permanence, this permanence delusion that, oh, this is going to be forever. I'm never going to have this. Right. Yeah. That's common in teenagers. And it happens throughout our lives. You know, when you're in a bad situation, it often feels like this bad situation will never end like the pandemic. We're all like, oh my God, is this permanent? Chris, in this ending? case, it never will end. Don't say that. I mean, because come on guys, let's be serious. <laughs> Please. We're only on that. Omicron. There's still several Greek letters to go. Okay, your hopelessness <laughs> is not hey, penetrating me, my mind. The glass is half broken. <laughs> all right. I'm Great. sorry, back to you. Okay, so I also want to say, perhaps controversially, it is also not abnormal for humans teens, adults, to occasionally have aggressive or homicidal thoughts. Yes, please talk more about this. Sure. Sometimes people want to hurt people very violently, and you think about it in your head, like someone messes with you at work, or your boss fires you, or uh, someone you love acts like a complete uh, a-hole, or um, someone wrongs you or physically hurts you. It is normal to think violent, aggressive thoughts. Mm. There's some quote that I'm going to forget, but it was something like, a violent thought a day keeps the psychiatrist away. Oh, wow. So, so you know, you and I have talked about tea kettling before. Right, where you blow off the steam by releasing emotion. Right. Negative yeah. emotions live in your body, not just in your head, and they have to come out in some way. Mm. So, you know, people punch a punching bag or they rip a phone book or they scream really loud in their car or people come up with, with st- strategies that work for them. I go for long runs, like, or whatever, or talk to friends. There's lots of ways of working that shit out. Mm-hmm. Um, one way of tea kettling is thinking the aggressive thoughts that you're not actually going to act on. Ah. So that's a version. Now, when suicidal ideation and homicidal ideation, and again, ideation is just thinking about it in your head, becomes active, that's when everyone should get worried. And I'm saying this very importantly, preceding this conversation we're about to have about children who go into schools with guns and kill people their peers who are also children uh, and commit violent crimes that they're never going to come back from. Mm. These kids are never going to be okay. The kids who commit the crimes, they clearly weren't okay, but now they're really never going to be okay. Mm. And I don't mean to be uh, dramatic about that, but, but when you're 15 and now you're a murderer, mm. I, I wonder how that goes for you for the rest of your life. Mm. So, so something that we all need to look out for And you please interrupt me if I'm like going, great. Something we all need to look out for is when passive ideation becomes active ideation. So the suicide part, I'll say first, because it's easier for me, because that's my realm of experience. And I've seen both happen. Passive suicidal ideation, someone comes to my office and they're like, things have been so bad lately. I just wish I wasn't here anymore. Or man, I'd rather be dead. Or I'm having thoughts of hurting myself, but I would never do it. Mm Mm-hmm. That's so passive. Passive. Uh, active suicidal ideation, I have also seen. It sucks. Uh, and it is, um, when I leave here, I'm going to get a razor blade. I don't want to trigger everybody. So mm-hmm. trigger warning. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to get an object and I'm going to harm myself because I don't want to be here tomorrow. Right. Or, or active is also... Um, I'm ready to die. I've given away some of my belongings. I've talked to a couple of friends about this is the end for me and I'm done. And so here's my plan. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to X, Y, and Z and then get this weapon and and that's my plan. Mm. And to be more concrete, what separa- separates or differentiates passive from active is plan and intent. Mm. Plan and intent. If someone has a plan of how they're going to kill themselves or someone else – plan. Mm. Intent, are you going to do it? The same is true with homicidal ideation. Mm. Homicidal ideation. I'm not worried about you if you're like, I'm going to effing kill everybody. I'm so pissed off. A lot of us have said that. That's just Tuesday for me. Yeah. Exactly. It's anytime I see Dr. Oz on TV. (laughs) I'm going to effing kill that guy. Dude, don't. I've never said the K word with Dr. Oz, all right? I'm not. No, 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 no. Right. But mentally in my mind, 
sure. like, yeah, we're on an island somewhere. There's only a limited <laughs> amount of food, and I hoard it all, and he and he dies of starvation. So, t- totally, it's a passive it's, death. It, I didn't. Right, <laughs> right. It's not aggressive. No, it's not violent no, even. No, no. It, ca- it keeps the psychiatrist away. Those thoughts. The, those thoughts. Yeah. Apparently, I'm told. My mother is a psychiatrist, and it keeps her away. <laughs> Mainly, there are many things that keep my mother away from me. <laughs> but yeah, that's a whole other kind of conversation. Anyways, back to which you. maybe we could have some time. Yes. Right. So active homicidal ideation is you have a plan. And you have intent to carry it out. So anyone who's been following this recent Michigan shooting with a 15-year-old child, uh, he had told a couple of people on a social media site Mm. that he planned to do it. Mm. He announced he had a gun. So intent, plan. That's what I want everyone to hear. What I want everyone to hear is there was intent. There was plan. This is a child who had active homicidal ideation. Active. He drew a drawing of children who had been killed. He drew bullets. Mm. They found, the teachers found it. Mm. They were very worried. Blessings. Mm. Uh, There was blood everywhere in the drawing. There was also a smiley face emoji. And it said, help me, the thoughts won't stop. Oh, my. Oh, dude, I'm telling you. My heart breaks when I read. Right. Mm. Right. Uh, Then the teachers caught him or someone, I think it was a teacher, saw him Googling where to buy ammo. Mm. Passive Mm. or active? Mm. Active. That that is the right answer. Mm. Now, uh, I I do not assign blame to anyone. Teachers are among the most amazing humans on the planet, in my humble opinion, and are doing a great service and should get paid what basketball players get paid. Mm. And I think we should swap that, actually. (laughs) Yeah. Let's swap those salaries. Um, but they're not trained to know what suicidal and homicidal ideation are, what passive versus active looks like, and when you act. So again, passive, I do not get worried. I mean, I'm like concerned and I want to talk about it, you know, and you want to figure out something's going on. Right. Active, you effing call 911 period. You don't call the parents. You don't have a school meeting. When a child is drawing pictures of dead children and Googling where to get ammo, that is active homicidal ideation. Mm. You call 911. I'm saying this because part of me wants to prevent this from ever. Can I? No. But, mm. but the more of us know the difference, the more we know what to look for, I think the more we'll change. I think if those teachers had known that, they would have all jumped to action. Mm, mm, uh, mm. By the way, mom, the kid's mom also knew. She oh, texted him, Wow, don't do it. Oh my. Don't do it. Instead of don't do it, you pick up the phone and you call 911. I know that's not casual for a parent right. to call 911. But do you know what would have happened, Zubin, if she had called 911 instead of texting don't do it? She would have saved her child's Life. Life and the lives of the other children. But, but to be clear, she she clearly wasn't worried about those other kids right. in that moment. She was only worried about her own. Right. If she had called 911, she would have saved his life. Why? He wouldn't have become a murderer. So 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 would they have involuntarily held him in a psychiatric? Correct. Yeah. Homicidal yeah, ideation. Yeah. Like they, he would have had full safety assessment. They would have been homicidal like- Homicidal intent. Sorry, plan. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. They would have realized he's actively homicidal. He's unsafe to self and others. He mm. would have been involuntarily hospitalized. They mm. would have found the gun. They would have done a full assessment and, and discovered that this child wasn't okay. Do you think pl- law enforcement is overwhelmed with these kind of calls already? Or do you think they're not getting enough of these calls when it's appropriate? What do you think is going I on? I think they're not even remotely getting enough of these calls mm. when appropriate. And I don't actually know if, I think my understanding is when a 911 call like that goes in, I think there is a mental health crisis team mm. that comes in and performs an assessment, right. mm-hmm. a safety assessment is what yeah. we call it. Mm-hmm. And I've seen that for active suicidality. Right. But because I've never reported active homicidality, I, I'm, I, I think my understanding is that it's pretty similar. Mm. Like, it's not like, it's not like the kid gets shot right. or, or, and he wouldn't have, have even been imprisoned. He, he didn't commit a crime yet. I mean, he had a gun and he was 15, but it was a gift from his parents. Right. Amazingly. Right. Enough. And that's right. a whole other. That's another discussion. Fish to fry. So, so what is it do you think that made this kid? That's a bigger, difficult question. Like what generates the homicidality? Is there a particular pattern? What 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 have you learned on this? Because it's not common knowledge. No, it's not. And, yeah. and again, I am not an expert on this. I just have gone down this rabbit hole because what happened to that 15-year-old child 
Like what broke him? Mm. Something happened. Do you have thoughts on this about like what happens to a child that they get to this place where well, they're- Well, I think it's interesting because it's predominantly a, a masculine issue. It's predominantly boys that this happens to. And that makes it interesting in that you're, you know, you have the mass shooter male phenotype there. So there's something going on with that interaction between maleness, whether it's testosterone or other things, and some psychological, biopsychosocial disturbance, right? And again, I just, the, the most I know about school shooters is from listening to, you know, Jeremy by Pearl Jam. And uh, <laughs> I don't know that that's psychologically or medically accurate. <laughs> um, you know, are there particular characteristics? Like what, what is it? Because it would help, I think, teachers and others and parents screen for these situations if it's like, well, it's usually an introvert, it's an extrovert. It's somebody who's had trouble in school, somebody who hasn't had trouble in school. You know, is there a pattern that you think that is there? So um, because, you know, because we got a bunch of these questions and because I wasn't confident, I understood myself mm. why this happens. I just started reading a bunch of stuff because I'm a nerd, mm. which is I like why that. we get along. That's yes. right. And then I started asking some of my teenage patients. Ah. Oh, it's been wild. Oh, tell me, tell me. Yeah, they came up with a lot of really interesting things that confirmed uh, what I had already been reading. Ah, so um, often. How dare you ask the subjects of your research <laughs> what's going on? And children are to be seen, not heard. Yeah, right. Right. Kids are so wise. Yeah. Kids know all the things. They know what's going on at home. Like any parent who thinks that the kids don't know what's going on between you and your partner. They know all the things. And I say this as a psychologist. Kids come in and they tell me, my parents are about to break up. Or my dad is just staying with my mom until I get out of here. And then they know everything. It's pretty wild. Um, So kids are very wise. So one one of my kids said, I have noticed, and he's right, that the majority, if not all... The, the kid shooters mm. um, have been white suburban male, mm. white suburban male. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, I noticed that a lot of them seem suicidal. Ah, interesting. Which is so fascinating to yeah. me because that's a different thing. I want to die in my mind is a different category than I want to kill someone else, but can they be conflated or can they be merged and both be true? Yes. And they can both be true. And it turns out that, in my mind, when you're suicidal, you have nothing to lose. Right. So all the rage, all the anger, all the unhappiness, all the unfairness, and to top it off, you have nothing to lose. Right. And it might be that nothing to lose that pushes you to do the thing that's essentially going to end your life anyway. Right, exactly. So that seems non-trivial, that a lot of these kids are suicidal. And what that means is they're hopeless. They have no positive sense of the future or their place in it. And again, they have nothing to lose by by doing this terrible thing and taking all of these lives. So it is, it's really part of a spectrum with uh, adolescent suicidality that perhaps there is a, a variant of this that actually also bleeds into the homicidality. And maybe there's a component of some conditioning, some genetic predisposition, some social... Uh, stuff that's happening, some parental stuff that's happening that conflates it all into this thing that is basically a powder keg and doesn't get the help for the suicidal ideation or the alienation and the white suburban kid is interesting. And then it explodes. It's, uh, you know, on a different end of that spectrum is death by, or suicide by cop, right? I I think that's part of this for a lot of them. Yeah, where it's like, I know I'm gonna die when I do this. I wanna die with a sense of whatever. I'm going to take people out with me. I have nothing to lose. Like, right. Yeah. So there is like a, an, a grandiosity, attention-seeking, like infamy component yeah. for a lot of these kids. Uh, right. Dylan, the, what's his name in Colorado had that. Yeah. Yeah, right. So that's exactly right. Mm. So you get named on famous podcasts if you shoot up a school. So now what I'm going to do forevermore is never, never name, name them. I'm never naming any that's of the kids. That's why I said, uh, what's his name? <laughs> yeah, what's his name? That's right. No, but everyone, at this point, everyone knows the name. Yeah, like the Columbine, yeah. like it's it's famous. Yeah. And I think for a lot of these, one of the people asked about copycats. What's very compelling for a lot of the copycats is the fame and notoriety. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. what teen doesn't want to be notorious? Yeah. 
And so when there's this combination, this biopsychosocial recipe of horrible things that happens that turns a 15-year-old into a murderer, one of those things is this like notoriety and attention seeking. And as you've said in the past, kids are always seeking attention and sometimes they don't know the best ways to do it. Mm. So negative attention seeking, hey, yo, that's still attention. It's attention, yeah. Right? Better than being ignored. So what do you think parents parents should just be vigilant for these signs? Because right. I know there's probably a lot of parents right now who have kids that have maybe behavioral disturbances or male, you know, they're into like violent video games or whatever the usual stereotypes are of this stuff and right. they don't know well, how, when does it get to a point, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so I remember the first thought I had when we were looking this up, like what makes a 15 year old into a killer? Killers are made, not born. Hmm. Killers are made not born. So but, even a born psychopath is not, it's not enough to make them a killer. So that term psychopath yeah. is a DSM diagnosis. Yes. Antisocial personality disorder. Correct. Right. Every single thing in the DSM is a biopsychosocial recipe. Uh -huh. There's not a single thing in the DSM that isn't biopsychosocial. What has happened to this child in his home life? What kind of abuse? So to answer your question, Part of the biopsychosocial recipe is uh, physical or emotional or sexual abuse. Mm. Often, this is often not always, right. witnessing domestic violence at home, mm. witnessing adults and parents modeling aggression and violence as a way to solve a problem, mm -hmm. parental mental health problems, parental substance abuse, being the outcast at school and being rejected and being bullied mm. and, and being the kid that isn't liked. And what I want to say about that, and I want to say this carefully, is if you ask me, I knew who those kids were in my school and yeah. I was worried about them. Yeah. You too? Yeah, I did. Yeah. You can think about it. Yeah. So back to that thing, kids are wise. Kids know the other kids who might not be okay. Yeah. And I want to be clear. I am not saying that children can point out the next school shooter. Right. Totally not. But kids know who the kid among them is who is rejected and isolated and dark yeah. and maybe just not okay because there's some real bad shit going on at home. Yeah. And they're getting the crap kicked out of them or like whatever is happening Worse. between. Yeah. There's just things that are not okay. Yeah. And, and again, it's not just what's going on at home. There's a biopsychosocial recipe happening here. They're, the kid's also being bullied at school. Right. They're not succeeding oftentimes academically. Uh, biologically, they, they may be prone to depression or grandiosity, I read, um, or again, a tendency towards violence. They may be really fascinated or obsessed with past shootings and they talk about it a lot and they draw a lot of pictures of, mm -hmm. and like, you know, just to be, I, I'm always trying to be careful because so many boys in our culture yeah. draw guns constantly and want guns. My brother wanted guns, like cap yeah. guns and all the guns. You'll shoot your eye out. You'll shoot your <laughs> eye out. You'll shoot your eye out. What is that from? A Christmas uh, story? Christmas story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's yeah. part of American culture. Right. So and that kid was bullied. And that right. kid was an outcast. And that kid had parents that were having some difficulty with the lamp that looked like a leg. Totally. Of course, it's like, the most mild form so of, mild. of adverse childhood experience totally. that, that child could have. Anyways, back that's to you. That's right. No, no, but, but you just, that's right. So, so one can easily see that it's a recipe of all of these things together. It's not just one thing. Mm. Like, it's not like a kid has depression and has been drawing guns. He's probably going to be a shooter. It's not that mm. at all. Mm. It's this like total recipe of toxicity. Mm. A and also part of the recipe is nobody stepping in. Right. No help. No. Yeah. I remember when I think back to the kids in my school who I was like, that kid's not okay. Can I tell you a story? Yeah. It's a little bit embarrassing. I'm not sure I should, but I'm going to. I was in sixth grade in Mrs. Feltenstein's class. <laughs> <laughs> and she had pushed like four of us together. Like she had grouped us in groups of four. Uh, and there was a girl in my group. Let's call her Penny. That was not her name. And Penny was not okay. Mm. Uh, I don't exactly know what I mean by that. It's hard for me to like find the language, but... Behaviorally, behaviorally, she was just off. Mm. Socially, she was off. She she couldn't find the right things to say. She said things that were like a little off the wall. Behaviorally, she was like leaping from here to there. Mm. She, it was hard for her to sit still. Mm. Um, when she tried to play with you, it was overly aggressive. So people just didn't want to play with her. Everyone right. stayed away from her. She was- The self-fulfilling prophecy of isolation. 
Yeah. And people were mean to her, never me, but people were mean to her. She was bullied. Um, mm. And she was different. Uh, she was very different. She dressed differently. Mm. Her hair was always messed up. And one day in our little pod of four, she very casually started telling the story about how she was being physically abused at home. Uh. And she showed us these marks all over her arms. Oh, my God. And I was a hyper, still am, hypersensitive little kid. Mm. Um, and I did not know what to do. Mm. I knew that I needed to help Penny. Penny needed help. She, she was telling us that she was being hurt at home. We saw these horrible bruises all over her. And nobody was helping her. And I went to Mrs. Feltenstein and I said, I don't want to get in trouble, but someone needs to help Penny. Penny is not okay. So um, the teachers got involved. I never knew what happened. No one ever told me. But, but I think what I'm humbly submitting wow. here today is all the kids at all the schools know the kids who are not okay. What would happen if we mobilized our wise, wise children as the first red flag screen for the mm. kids who need a little extra support and need some eyes on them and maybe would benefit from a school counselor and maybe a peer support group. What about that? Oh, wow, that story. So these are my thoughts and for what they're worth. Yes, and also, oh boy. And the oh boy comes from this. Children also are very good manipulators of other children and True. bullies. So True. imagine they now have the power to point out someone who's different to the teachers yeah. and have an intervention, which is humiliating if you're not requiring it, and is also a power differential with the kids in the masses. So that, that's the only caveat that I think of, but imagine if the kids were actually tr taught early on some degree of emotional intelligence Intense. that they could then say, but this is the thing, right? And it's not just about them, it's about you because that person could become the next school shooter, but also don't you feel for this person? Yeah. Because, you know, this idea that when, when we bully kids, when we're in, in school, and I'll tell you this, like with full transparency, I was bullied, I was also a bully, both Wow. in a spectrum. Wow. There were at least a couple kids that I used to pick on and there were at least, 20 kids they used to pick on me. And it was my way of feeling like, okay, I'm somewhere in the hierarchy that isn't the bottom, right? And this is, I don't know, third grade, fourth grade, whatever it is. And to this day, I feel guilty about, you know, the little boy or girl that I picked on. And what's crazy is th they came up on an Instagram feed and had somehow years later, I mean, showed up in, and saw me as whatever pseudo celebrity. Your bully? Or no, the no, person you bullied? person I bullied. Wow. And they emailed me and said, oh, do you remember me? I'm, you know, I still live in this town and I do that. And I was like, do I remember you? Like I, I still have so much guilt over how I behaved as a child because now I have the abstract reasoning to be able to go, oh my God, like what was I doing? And I actually apologized to this person. That, that like, was gonna be my next question. Do you remember when I used to do this or that or pick on you and this and that? And they were just like, oh no, I just figured, you know, that's just how kids are. And I'm like, it's not how kids are. And I don't think that's what you really think. You're being nice, right? But this idea that children could be educated if they could put themselves in another person's shoes. Yeah. Like what you just described, like, yeah. you know, she's off, she's off. And the initial judgment response is, yeah, there's weirdos everywhere. And then you talk about what's actually happening at home and what they're going through. Yeah, what's yeah, yeah. And suddenly your heart opens and you go, oh my God, that could easily be me, Yeah. right? So, so yeah, this, this scenario that I imagine would have a lot of... Uh, much more thought about behind it than just like my little ruminating, you know, mm. but, and I don't mean flagging out the loners. I was like the loner library mouse. I sat alone every day in the library reading books. I would have totally turned you into the principal. Like, I think she's the next school <laughs> yeah. shooter. Uh. So I don't mean that. And I don't mean it in a tattletale way, way either. Like, this is not a thing where we're like getting revenge right, right. on the loners. No, of this course, is a thing yeah. where we're just like saying compassionately to teachers, hey, I'm wondering if this is person is okay. And can we invite them to like the next peer group or whatever? It's yeah. not a tattletale situation. Yeah. It's not like a leveraging thing, but, but I, I see where it would go sideways. So we would just have to be very careful with this plan. We'd have to teach. But, but yeah. can I ask a question? Yeah. Why, if you're comfortable answering, why were you bullied and what were you bullying the other kid about? And, and I'll tell you why I'm asking after you answer. So I was bullied because I was chubby and not very good at sports at all. Cause my parents didn't value that at all. And kind of had a funny name, right? Like in a kind of pretty white bread farming conservative town. Right. And um, 
and I was weird. I'm a weird kid. So meaning I'm probably, you know, you called yourself a bookworm library mouse. I, I was like the guy who had a telescope and was like, wanted to be an astrophysicist and would grow plants in my room because I was fascinated by how chloroplasts worked and stuff like that. I wish we had been friends. Oh, we would have been <laughs> totally, God, it would have been a story for the ages. And, um, and so who I bullied was actually me just a little bit more on the on on a different spectrum of that. So a little overweight, a little weird, foreign, right? Not bullied for those reasons, but bullied, I, it was non-specific bullying, but I know why I targeted them now in retrospect because, and they were clearly even lower in the pecking order than I was. So the power differential was already there. And, um, you know, what's crazy is the amount of guilt that you feel. Even then, even then I remember, I was like, God, this is not, what am I doing? I can't help myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you're getting bullied at the same time. Right. <laughs> so it's like this right. constant, but yeah, it really did affect me. I remember, uh, and, and you know, and the, there's not, there's no support in those days. It's just like, you just, that's just school. That's just what you do. Right. Yeah. So it, it's really interesting. I think it's, it is an important molding too of your who you are as an adult. Right. Yeah? Right. Yeah. Bullies bully because they're not okay. Uh huh. Right. Bullies that's bully pretty because clear. Yeah. They're not okay. Yeah. 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 So, so in my mind, we have this something, something set up where like the kids who are bullies and mm -hmm. the kids who are not okay, we help them to be okay. And we set up a system to do that because everyone in the school, every child, every teacher, every principal knows the kids that are not okay. I'm just going to say that loud and clear. Yeah. Like, we know, and again, I am not saying that all those kids are mentally ill and I'm not saying they're school shooters and I'm not saying there's something wrong with them. I am saying there's something emotionally happening. Let's take care of them. Like this compassion right. thing, let's right. elevate that. Well, plus it breaks a cycle because that child, because mo most kids do not grow up to be school shooters. True. Right? But they do grow up to perpetuate the same cycle of abuse, violence, alienation, et cetera, in their own families. And the adverse childhood experiences also lead to chronic disease. And so this is a cost to society. It's a cost to future generations. And if we intervene now, heaven forbid, we might prevent that cost instead of having to manage the consequences yeah. of funerals and yep. you know, ICUs full with yep. people with diabetes. Yep. Yeah. And I can only imagine like the red flags that the parents were seeing at home. And I don't want to minimize actually the role of parents because you know, mm. I get a kid for an hour a week. Right. Parents are my boots on the ground. Like parents see our parents are with kids all day every day. And teachers, by the way, also are our boots on the ground. Like and I think we need more education in in our education system. And more resources, yeah. Yeah, and more resources yeah. for like what looks unhealthy to the point of like we really should call nine one one and like not be casual about it. Yeah. Like yeah. the drawings that we saw and the words that we saw on the paper, the thoughts won't stop, please help me. Yeah, man, that's horrible. So that's bad. We could talk about this for, yeah, forever, we, we, but we've gone for thirty minutes on yeah, it. I love it. It's I really because it's, it's, it's compelling, actually, and it's, it's like it, it's something that yeah, it's not just about school shooters, right? Of it's course about not. Everything. So, so can I tell a story? Oh, Again, please! I, I don't I know how many of these stories. questions we'll get to. Maybe we'll just do a three-hour interview. But the <laughs> <laughs> we'll go full Rogan, right? I just talked to a physician yesterday, um, a pediatrician who was filling me in on what's going on with COVID and kids. And the first thing I asked is, so are you seeing ICUs full of COVID patients? Are you, what's going on? He goes, nah, there's the occasional MISC case. There's the occasional kid who's got comorbidities, who's on a ventilator. And we all flip out over it because in pediatrics, actually we don't see that stuff that often because generally childhood vaccines present, prevent a lot of stuff. And it's just not that common. So it's a big deal when we see an MISC and it gets really you know, fully explored. But what I, what I am seeing that people are not talking about enough is an epidemic of anxiety, depression, suicidality, um, ADHD because, or ADD because the kids are just, they are so isolated. They cannot, the social fabric has been so torn. Their routines have been decimated. They're seeing their parents' routines decimated. The parents are now at home when they weren't at home or they're gone or whatever it is. And then he said, and I, I, I'm gonna tell you this story because uh, not to burden you, but just because I think it's important. My own son is ex in high school and has been, and this, these are high functioning parents, yeah. like smartest of the smart 
super trained at high end elite institutions and this kid is super smart, but is having all kinds of struggle, like mental breakdown because they've changed the structure of school to where the assignments are now due virtually by midnight. So the kid will push up until, you know, 1159 and lose his mind and, and realize it's not gonna happen. And, and the depression and the anxiety and his friends are, and so they went to a teacher and said, you know, we need to talk about this. And the teacher was so overwhelmed. And it turns out teacher themselves has a kid in the school that's struggling. And, and it just becomes this really difficult cycle. And COVID has made it infinitely more difficult. Are you actually seeing this stuff in your practice now? Kids being overwhelmed? Yeah. And anxious and depressed and suicidal? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. More than before. More than before. Yeah. You and I touched on this. Like the yeah. pediatric mental health crisis is real. Like yeah. Anxiety contagion is real. Like we have all, the adults have all been whipped up into a state of anxious frenzy by mm. the very melodramatic media. And anxiety contagion is adaptive. When people around you are anxious and panicking, children are going to be anxious and panicking too. And that goes back to that thing where like, if you're a hunter on the plane and there's a lion coming and everyone around you is panicking and screaming and running and you're just sitting there like, loo, 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 <laughs> you're going to get eaten. Yeah. But if your brain develops a mechanism to take that anxiety and, and run with it, literally, your life will be saved. So anxiety contagion is real. Our kids are all panicking. It's affecting their physical health, their emotional health across the board. There's like lethargy and lack of motivation. And now we've got like screen addiction times a four billion it's really hard to be a kid right now. It really is. And I think, I think again, the screen addiction, the technology piece cannot be overstated no, as, as a, as a it's thing. Bad. It's bad. The, you know, we've talked about this before, but you know, it's interesting that school shooting question had all the things that we largely answered, like how do we encourage children to think lovingly about other children, even those they don't like? Really, you have to, put, you have, to have a, a kind of a compassion where you're able to put yourselves in their position and inhabit it. That's right. And there are ways to actually even have unconditional love regardless of circumstance, but those are very ad difficult and advanced techniques that even adults have a lot of trouble with. Yeah. So I think kids, the, the empathy piece is is key. Yeah. And then what are better ways of addressing bullying? We talked about that. Um, and yeah. also like, why aren't we teaching all the classes we have in school, like American history and, you know, chemistry sociology whatever that why is why are we social teaching, studies can yeah. we teach emotions oh that'd be oh they so they do at my kids school uh -huh. they do that's amazing they're teaching in, my, in the elementary school they they learn these songs about how to recognize and name their emotions before they act out on them like crazy stuff can we give them a gold star what I, what amazing school it's that's, a public school in the bay area that's and, phenomenal. and and what's interesting is my youngest daughter, the 10 year old comes home and says, yeah, they're teaching us this emotional, um, I forget what they called it, emotional IQ or something. There was a name for it. And um, so, you know, we sing the song about when I'm angry I do, da, 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 and I was like, <laughs> hey, that's not bad. That's kind of catchy. Wait, can I hear the when, I, when I'm angry song? I don't remember Aww. it. Yeah, it was so catchy. I forgot it. Cause I was like, if this gets stuck in my head, it's gonna be there all day. Oh, yeah, she'll yeah. sing it. And um, it is interesting because I see her actually utilize it. She'll say, daddy, are you frustrated? Daddy, are you this? And I'm like, yeah, actually, that's really good. That's so exciting. she's helping you name your emotions. Told, oh my God, and I need it. So that's my model for like a beautiful future is kids having an emotional, an EQ, a yeah. high emotional IQ yeah. where they're in touch with, with their, I know I sound like such a therapist, but <laughs> understanding your own emotions and understanding other people's emotions is critical for life. Yes, it's critical for social interaction. Yep. It's critical for success. It's critical if you want to go into business or medicine. You have to understand your emotions and other people's emotions. It's critical even if you want to be a podcast host. Like all the things are important. You have to know what's resonant for your audience. You have to be able to read the person across from you. Emotional intelligence is so it, it helps you identify school shooters. Like all the things are important if we're going to be successful human beings. So how do you teach emotions to kids? Someone asked that. That was one of our questions from yeah. one of the Z-Dog, from one of the Z-Pack, I believe. Yes, you're right. How do you teach emotions to kids? It sounds like you're doing it very successfully. The, ki the kids are getting it in school. I don't know the exact plan they're using. And then I talk to them about emotion too, because <clears throat> as an adult, I'm learning about Sure, emotion. And can I, can, I t can I tell a quick story? So Please. I what told this- What were we here for? We're here to just chillax. That's <laughs> a, apparently <clears throat> what the 90s kid said. Yeah. You know, it's tight, bro. 
<laughs> we're just chillaxing. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I've been doing excessive amounts of meditation um, the last few weeks since I came back from this retreat. And you get this assumption that meditation somehow generates equanimity and emotional regulation and allows you to just be all joy and unicorn farts. Mm. And it's not my experience <clears throat> of meditating. Exactly. Yeah. So what I found is, and I, again, there's a lot of meditation where it's disidentifying from thought and unle uh, just really silencing the thinking mind. Well, what's underneath the thinking mind, the emotional intuitive mind. And it turns out the thinking mind loves to repress emotion. We're conditioned to do it from we're very young. And we repress, deny, project, we do all these things. Doctors are very good at that. In fact, it's a part of our training almost to compartmentalize and repress emotion. Because wow. how do you get through the day? So what happens when you do a lot of meditation or even a little meditation is sometimes those safety valves come off and the tea kettle just is allowed to pop open. And it comes in a way that is often surprising and can generate the contralateral emotion of shame because you're like, I thought I was supposed to be oh. in control. So this happened to me the other day, I was driving home. I just done a show on Zen or something. And I'm driving home and I stop at a stop sign in my own neighborhood. It's a four way, it's a very sleepy little bedroom community. And there's a test, blue Tesla pulls up to the stop sign in front of me. And I don't know if I told this story on my other podcast, but at this point, I've got my blinker on and I real—I was actually being quite mindful. I was like, oh, I pulled up to the, I got the right of way because I arrived at this sign first. So I'm gonna make my left. This guy's gonna go straight. Well, I make my left and he then decides to go, but he stops because he sees me going. I'm halfway through the intersection and he lays on the horn. That's an older guy with a family of four people in there. Just lays on it. And you're like, I've just been meditating, bruh. This is what happened. Instant. Oh, Primal rage yeah. comes through me. Yeah, like if I did not, if if I it, 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 I was very close to opening the door and getting out and getting in his face. That's yeah. how bad it was. Oh yeah, I was entertaining the idea instantly. Yeah. But what I did do was passive I stopped homicidal ideation. Passive, that's exactly when you brought it up earlier. I was like, "This is me. This is me." The other day, <laughs> I'm gonna throttle that. I'm guy. gonna. I'm totally gonna kill this guy. And and so what ended up happening was I I stopped in the intersection where I was. Yeah, I rolled. This took premeditation. But the emotion was instant, I felt yeah, 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 it. Yeah, yeah. I was quite mindful of it. Roll down the window and just stick my middle finger out the window and yeah. yell, F you, you F and piece of F. And <laughs> this is my own neighborhood. You don't shit in your own nest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I was like, roll back up the window, continue with my left turn and go home. <laughs> and I just look out of the, I see them and they're You're just like- Is like, he following me? They just look stunned, like yeah. what just happened? And I drove home with no anger residual at all. It had all tea kettled out. You tea kettled. I tea kettled out, but this is what ended up happening. Immediately I felt shame. I was like, mm. oh, I'm better than I'm this. A, I just road raged on an old guy. I'm a bad person. Who's just d a dumb and doesn't know how to drive. I mean, <laughs> that's what I was thinking, right? Yeah. And it, so I went and I confessed to my wife and my daughter. I was like, this is I what happened. Bad person. And they, they, they shamed the crap out of me. They were like, aren't you <laughs> meditating four hours a day? <laughs> like, aren't you doing this? As if that's like a panacea. Exactly. That's and so then I felt, I, then I felt appropriate. I, in fact, I told them because I wanted them to punish me a little bit. Like I was like, come on. Subin. And so then, so then I text. Everyone does dumb shit. You know that, yeah? I do. I kind of do. But There's you, not a single human. But I did inhabit the shame. And so then what happened was I, I texted my, my teacher in meditation and said, this happened to me. And he goes, oh, he goes, this is a thing that nobody talks about in meditative spiritual circles, that you come in contact with raw primal emotion. Of course. And it will shock and surprise you. You'll yeah. wonder where it came from. Yeah. And the best you can do is not act on it, which is something you'll do because you have equanimity, you just don't know it. And the best thing is to just let it pass, feel it, you and have then to not feel cling the to it. You feel it, you, you don't repress it. The you don't tell stories about it. You don't- Ignore it. Ignore it. No. If you ignore it, it's, it's there forever. So I'm curious what you think about this. So many thoughts. <laughs> I had like so many thoughts. I hope I even remember what they all were. Um, first thought was good that you tea kettled. Yelling and flipping the bird is so much better there are dry. There are things like that that happen oh, yeah. in Oakland where someone takes out a gun and shoots someone in Absolutely. the head. Absolutely. If I had so, a gun there, could you imagine? You would so, not have done it. I wouldn't have done it. You would not have done it. You could imagine if it's easy, right? Even 
with I will impulse humbly control submit, issues. I would humbly submit that even if you had had a gun in your car, you would have not come even close yeah, yeah, to even yeah. pointing it. That's true. Because your prefrontal cortex, yeah, which works. controls your impulses, works very well. Almost too well. Yeah. Right. Guess what 15-year-old boys uh, don't have? A developed prefrontal cortex. They Bing. don't develop until their 20s. This is great. We're just going to go full circle all day with yes. how all the things are biopsychosocial. Yes. When you're 15 and you're given a gun by your parents, and I'm just going to say this, unilaterally, no parent should give a 15-year-old a gun without major restrictions and training. controls, yeah. training and education on how to use it and when not to use it. Yeah. Period. End yeah. of sentence. Yeah. And guns should always be locked up in the home. Always. Right. Because I think it was something like, 75% of the guns used in these school shootings came directly from the home right. or were given by a parent. Right. So we just have to be careful because, right. because back to this 15 year old who I have such intense compassion for, even if yeah. there's something going on there, his prefrontal cortex was not even yet developed. Did he have a shot at making the, the right decision? Yes. Did he have a shot at making the best decision possible if he had been an adult? No, because he's a 15-year-old child yeah, yeah, yeah. and his prefrontal cortex is not yet fully developed. Yeah. So, so the odds were stacked given everything else going on also. Mm. You throw that into the biopsychosocial puzzle, like that part of your brain that prevents you from getting out of your car and punching some <laughs> j you know, a-hole in Poor the face. Poor old guy. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old guy. He was laying on his horn. He was like 50. I consider that old. I'm 48. Hey, watch out. I'm like this old fart. Yeah, watch out. Honking at me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look, look, you're everyone's allowed to get angry. Everyone's allowed to express anger. Like this is a pet peeve of mine that people think in our culture you're not allowed to express anger. F yeah, you are. Mm. You, you have to anger is one of those emotions. If you don't express it, it's gonna live in your body and fester and you're gonna get physically ill. We all know that. Yeah. Like we get stomach aches and back aches and all that crap. Sleep disturbances. Sleep whole, disturbances yeah. when you don't express anger. Yeah. But there's healthy ways of expressing anger. Yeah. You can use your words. You can go rip <laughs> phone books. You, you know, you can go punch a punching bag. You know, you can go for a run until you're so tired you can't get up. You could take a hot shower or a cold bath. Like I mean there's lots of ways of tea kettling when you're angry. But for to say to people you can't express it, mm mm so bad. So so um, God, so many other thoughts too. Uh, but but what I like about it is that then you came home. We're talking about how to teach emotions to kids. Mm. You then came home to your two lovely daughters and you gave them a situation. You modeled and you labeled. Modeling is when you uh, give an example of how you felt an emotion and expressed it. And labeling is when you put words on the emotions. Mm. So you said, I was driving along, this tool bag started <laughs> honking at me and it triggered in me anger and rage and here's what i did that i shouldn't have done yes but but so you modeled the whole thing you modeled the emotions you felt and you said and now i'm feeling shame and regret and i'm yeah. feeling bad yeah. so you did a perfect modeling of how certain emotions are normally and naturally associated with certain situations and then the other emotions that follow when you handle a certain situation in a certain way mm -hmm. that is emotional modeling you just did the thing that i wrote down to talk about Oh, wow. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. It's like we're like- um, Psychically those, aligned. Exactly. Those two guys <laughs> from uh, G.I. Joe, uh, Tomax and Zamot, who were twins and they shared a psychic connection. <laughs> You're welcome. And by the way, Tomax <laughs> is Zamot spelled backwards. <laughs> oh my hey, God, G.I. Joe just entered the conversation. Now you know, and knowing is half the battle. Another I used to watch that when I was a kid with my brother. Cobra. G.I. Joe. I used to like Cobra the, Commander because he, he was the same oh voice God. that did Starscream from the Transformers. He was like, yes, Destro. It's Cobra Commander. G.I. Joe is coming. And Destro was like, Cobra Commander. He, he talked like uh, James Earl Jones. <laughs> so delightful. It's a whole thing. Oh, God, I'm so delighted. I just like now and I just want to do voices. We could do that for the rest of the Did you also watch, um, God, the lion. What were those lions? Thundercats. Thundercats. Dude. Not only did I watch Thundercats, yeah. I, wa I started rewatching it with my youngest because we would just <laughs> laugh at how stupid it was. So, you know, thunder, 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 Thundercats. Oh, ho, the right? And they're, da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da, and they're like the lion, and you hear, <laughs> they turn into, and they had Mumra, ancient spirits of evil. I was terrified of Mumra. He's a scary dude. He's, he's lived thousands of years. He's like a walking, pharaoh, scabby, mummy. mummy. And he, and he prays to the ancient spirits of evil. And there's all drool coming out of his oh, mouth. Oh, yeah, because he's like, <laughs> and uh, Snarf. 
the little snarf, strange snarf, snarf. Snarf. talk yeah. about someone who got bullied. Oh, we have snarf. to really hard out for Snarf. Oh, my snarf God. had a lot of adverse Snarf experiences. It's true, as a but child. he never grabbed a gun and shot other because they wouldn't let Thunder because guns. he had community Lionel social support. They had social support with the cats. See social. They had Lionel would always keep his sort of omens locked up. Mm. He taught uh, Chitara, the female. Um, uh, uh, thing and the two kids, lion cat and lion kitty, whatever. I have no, I literally, this has been like so long for me. They learned weaponry from the best and safety, responsible use of weapons. that's right. We're not, you know, didn't ban the weapon, said, listen, here's how you use the sword of omens. Yep. Okay, you gotta say ho at the end. And never, there's, there's something about trigger hygiene. Trigger, you gotta say ho at the end. You gotta say ho at the end. If you say ho at the beginning, you can put an eye out. The thing grows. We have to say ho. <laughs> that's right, Zoodog out. Oh, that's right. Amazing, amazing. Oh you know, God. this is a perfect segue into like, the next question because really this is good. It really because is. we're giggling like oh we're God. on marijuana. Have, yeah, right. And this is a question from our. And this is a as good if one. we're high. Exactly. But we're not sober. Totally but we're not. sober. Marijuana for pain is that a thing? Can you talk about marijuana for pain? I have such. I hear such mixed things. Even my parents have tried it. Helpful for pain? Yes or no? Via Twitter, for Sam. Pain. Via Twitter. Yes or no. Okay, so we have talked about the fact that I am a pain doctor and I am fascinated by pain because it is a ubiquitous human experience and none of us will escape having pain at some point in our lives if we don't have it now. Yeah. And pain has been grossly mistreated for many decades. We have framed it as a biomedical problem. So what I mean by that is just to do with the body and you treat that thing with pills and procedures primarily, if not exclusively, but what has happened? Again, chronic pain is on the rise. We have an opioid epidemic. People in pain are not getting better. Most people in pain will tell you that they have been in pain for like 20 or 30 years without respite. It's pretty bad. So we are always understandably, and myself included, looking for a quick fix. Who does not want a fix from pain? Pain is miserable. Pain hurts, which is like a profound obvious yeah and yet statement <laughs> pain hurts hurts implies the suffering component of pain pain itself the raw experience so i think it's actually a, not not as obvious as it sounds yeah thank you that you just took it another level and <laughs> no 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 but in a really really good way and thank mm, you for that thank you that is right the suffering component of pain is not to be overlooked um so I have so many things to say about pain, but I'm not going, I'm going to hold myself back because I will get so far off subject that we won't answer this question. The Mary Jane. So um, when I was an undergrad at Brown, I worked with this very cool guy, J. Michael Walker. And his- God, that name is so awesome. J. J. Michael, Michael Walker, Walker, professor at Brown. How are yep. you, ladies? Yep. He studied yeah. the neuroscience and neurophysiology of pain. Oh. And I wrote my honors thesis with him. Wow. And he was, may he rest in peace, a total pothead. Like oh. absolutely long beard, fish head, grateful dead. Nice. Um, super nice and brilliant guy. And he was studying specifically, bear with me, this is really obnoxious, nerdy language, uh, Anandamide, ah, which is an endogenous sadder. cannabinoid. Endogenous cannabinoid. What I mean by that is your brain already produces the chemicals that are found in marijuana. That's why marijuana works when you eat it or smoke it, because the, the cannabinoids bind to the receptors that already exist in your brain. That's the mechanism of action, and that's why they work. So his research was endogenous cannabinoids, again, those cannabis-like substances that already exist in your brain, what do they do for pain? That was his research question. Ah. Right. So he would use hot plate tests, which is uh, very ethically dubious, where you put mice on oh. hot plates mm -hmm. and you raise the temperature. And if they have high levels of endogenous cannabinoids, Will they stay on the hot plate longer? Will they be able to tolerate Higher pain, pain threshold oh. longer? PETA, right. PETA's gonna pay uh, J. Michael Walker a, a visit. He is no longer with us. Oh. And studies like that actually are done fairly regularly, regularly. I think. Yes. You know who else isn't with us? Jan Michael Vincent. Mm. And Why? Um, I, I believe he died, but not, not before producing probably the greatest drama 
of the 80s, Airwolf. Okay. Um, as it. Stringfellow Hawk. You missed Airwolf. I did. Sorry. Don't fire me. You know what? I'm going to put you on a hot plate and slowly <laughs> raise the temperature <laughs> and, and force, you, force you to watch no. Airwolf. I, no, I declined that invitation. All right. Well, I'm that's sorry. okay. So, I'm not so back to, to this that. ethically dubious experiment. Yes. Yeah, so, so the, the mice. So for my many years of training in pain, one of the things I've always been curious about yeah. is endogenous cannabinoids, those things that your brain already produces. By the way, we also have endogenous self-made opioids. Those are called endorphins. Yes. So if you like go for a runner's high or you have a runner's high, those are your endorphins. Yeah. So our brain produces all sorts of pain regulation chemicals already. Um, but I've been doing a ton of reading about marijuana and other sorts of cannabinoids for pain. Um, and I always, literally until this week, was under the impression that the research supported that marijuana and derivatives, cannabis, cannabinoid-like substances could ease pain. Mm. Now, before you give me yeah. the punchline of this, yeah, yeah, yeah. what did I, J. Michael Walker's mice end up showing with the Anandi? Higher pain tolerance. Ah, so it did with cannabinoids. Correct. Okay, all right. That's my memory, and I'd In have mice. to go back. These are research papers from a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And it, I don't know if they were, you know, if other things have been shown since then. Or Got it, got it, got it. Before, before the punchline, what has your impression been? Correct. About this whole Correct. marijuana for pain. So, <clears throat> so I did, and by the way, I'm an advocate for legalizing pretty much everything. Um, I did a piece on this a few years back and it was looking at the evidence basis based on James McCormick's work in University of British Columbia, where he reviewed all the literature that looked high quality on cannabis and uh, the like. And what he found was there were three real indications that were evidence-based. One was spasticity from like multiple sclerosis. Right, right. I've heard that too. Definitely. The second was a seizure, ch ch pediatric seizure stuff, which we, we have now have pharmaceutical derived can cannabinoids for that. Um, the third thing uh, was uh, chemotherapy induced nausea. Right. And the fourth thing actually, because this was another thing, was they said chronic pain from neuro neurogenic origin, um, neuropathic pain, yeah. typically. Yeah. Uh, and there's some evidence, some, and, and but the evidence was based on a synthetic cannabinoid they were giving mm. that was eaten, that was not smoked. Uh -huh. It was not natural cannabis. Uh -huh. So that, that was what I talked about in those things. Everything else, like anxiety, all those other things, it did not look like it helped at all from the literature. Um, were you ever in a position where you could prescribe it? Um, yeah, I was asked to prescribe it and then it became largely legal in California, even before that for medical purposes. So people have occasionally asked me and I, I'm not averse to it, but yeah. I would have a conversation with them and say, well, so what is what are we really are doing we this for? Yeah. Right? Because you have to be careful with um, the, the right indication for it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I believe I have done it at least once or twice. Yeah. Years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I am also, by the way, I am also not opposed. My thought about pain and pain medicine and everything to do with pain is like, if it works, oh, let's use means. it. Even like, if it's placebo, I'm happy. Oh, if it doesn't cause harm. Placebo yeah. all day. Like, all day. Please give me a placebo pill. Me God, too. Please. I Give it to me IV. Yeah. Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll snort oh, yeah, placebo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we should yeah. talk about placebo one day. Yeah. You know that there's this study that shows that... You have these people randomized to these groups where they think they're getting knee surgery, they're actually getting knee surgery, or like, I can't remember what the third one is. Uh, uh, yeah, I forget. It's like nothing. They or they pretend to cut the skin. I don't know what yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Or like it's like a sham cut surgery. It. Yeah, right, yeah, they actually cut it, but they like blow air into it and then yeah. seal it back. Yeah. And like the people who thought they got surgery, ha I think they performed even better than the people who got the actual surgery. They didn't have all the complications. Anyway, right? just to say, I yeah. want placebo all day. All day. So a study came out in July 2020. 2021, so this year, like just a few months ago, about the effectiveness of marijuana, cannabinoids, and like everything to do with cannabis for pain. And the summary, which I'm going to read just because- So it was like reading, a meta-analysis. It was of a meta-analysis of all the things. Yes. And what they said was that there is no, currently no reliable evidence to support the use of cannabis, cannabinoids, or cannabis-based medicine in the treatment of chronic acute or cancer pain. Mm. And 
that medical marijuana and associated cannabinoids can cause significant secondary issues with sleep and memory and attention and problem-solving skills. And I think any of us who have ever smoked before Mm. know that sometimes sleep and attention and problem-solving do fall by the wayside. And of course, when it comes to pain, we're not talking about like sitting around smoking a joint. There are different forms of cannabis, the THC has been removed. The CBD forms, and there's edible and smoked. Right. There's different first pass metabolism or not. There's all kinds of metabolic uh, vagaries around it, which is why these studies are difficult too. Exactly right. Yeah, their studies are difficult. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. It, it's unsurprising to me, but it's also something where I would never, and I think you agree with me, I would never say, well, hey, if you find that cannabis works for your pain, Stop using no, it. No, I would it, never say that. Never, because it's like, hey, it works for you. That's work, great. If it works for you, work it. Absolutely. Maybe it's something the science has missed. Maybe it's a placebo effect. Who cares? Maybe it's the chemistry of your unique brain and body. Can, can I tell you a theory I have that yes. is total BS, but I'll tell it to you. So, you know, I had this guy, Donald Hoffman, on the show who uh, his theory is that he's a cognitive scientist at UC um, um, Irvine and a psychology professor as well. And he studies AI and different things. And his theory is that humans don't see reality, we see um, an interface, like a graphical user interface that is species specific, it's evolutionary, and it evolved not to show us the truth of the world, but to show us a dumbed down symbolry that represents fitness payoffs, meaning I'm very likely to eat that and do well. I'm very likely to have sex with that and reproduce. And so we see these kind of, this matrix like that. Now, so that interface, is pointing at a real reality. There's something out there. He says it's all these conscious agents interacting, who cares, right? The bottom line is we all have our interface. Within the species, there's variation in the interface. So some people see um, things, like some people can have synesthesia and can actually smell colors and things like that. Those are mutations in our graphical user interface. And he calls it the interface theory of perception. And there's a lot of data, he has a whole book on it called The Case Against Reality. Now, what I suspect is and from my own personal experience with these things, is that people who, their baseline interface tends to the more paranoid, the slightly more anxious, the slightly more unsettled in a baseline state can take a compound like a cannabinoid and shift their interface. That's what these drugs may do in this theory. Shift their interface a couple clicks to the right where now what used to make them a little unhappy or uncomfortable or anxious is now much more okay. And they see the world through this different interface. Yeah. You and I may take that with a different baseline interface and get more paranoid, anxious, unhappy, and wonder how that person can smoke weed all day, every day. Yeah. And so these variations in our own personal interfaces, which are the complex biopsychosocial interaction of us and the world, whatever that means, um, manifest different things. That's why I would never tell somebody, hey, if that works for you, don't. don't." Oh, totally yeah, agree. Yeah. So, I totally agree. Throw it back I to did, you. it really threw me for a loop though, to read this because yeah. for many years, I was laboring under the impression that, you know, when used correctly in particular doses or forms that, you know, um, cannabis could be an effective treatment for pain um, across, across the board. Um, and reading that the studies did not support that really shook me. Mm. Um, but I agree with you 100% that, so can I tell you a story? Yes, please. Okay, so a couple of years ago, and I'm changing the identifying information please. on my patients, of course, to protect identity because that is how I roll. So a uh, 26-year-old young adult, uh, let's call him Sam, uh, came to my office with a condition called Fabre disease. Mm, I've heard of that. What I do forget you, what it is, Fabry disease. Do you remember anything F-A-B-R-Y? about it? F-A-B-R-Y? F-A-B-R-Y. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, well, the, the gist of it is it's a genetic condition uh, and it leads to pretty serious peripheral neuropathy uh, and mm. in the feet in particular. Oh, wow. Uh, and this 26-year-old came wheeled into my office in a wheelchair um, and he was, his body language told me he was depressed, mm. his hunched over, his face looked completely stricken and um, depressed. Uh, his toenails had not been cut in something like eight months mm. or more, and they were very long, like almost claw-like, and his feet were bare. 
and his per- their peripheral neuropathy, the pain of his feet, was so intense that he couldn't even put his feet on the um, on the what are they? The, the little thing at the bottom of the exam table? No, on the no. wheelchair. You oh, know, there's yeah, like the, the little, little pet- supports, pedals yeah. or supports or whatever. Mm-hmm. So we had like cushion foot rest. Foot, that's what it's word thinking. finding difficulties. I know. I, Cannabis. We're both high. Yeah, <laughs> obviously. Um, right. So. He had like cushioned slippers or something at the very bottom, or they had put, like pasted the slippers to the footrest or something. Um, to be clear, this was a kid who was not okay. He was not okay. He was miserable. He hadn't been able to. He had, a college student had not been able to attend college. He had a lot of hobbies. He couldn't engage in any hobbies. He couldn't walk. He was wheelchair bound. Um, his parents had tried everything for his pain. Uh, like, as often happens, I was the last stop on the train mm-hmm. because, as you well know, nobody with pain wants to see a psychologist right. for pain because we have framed pain as a purely biological, biomedical problem. And who is going to see a psychologist for a biomedical problem if that just suggests that maybe your pain is all in your head or mm. you're mentally ill? And, of course, that's not what it is. Pain is a biopsychosocial problem. It requires a biopsychosocial solution. And a pain psychologist like me looks at the hot, whole biopsychosocial problem and is like, okay, what are the things we need to change in all of these domains to treat you as a whole person? Because you're not just your feet. And so far, treating just your feet isn't actually working. So, <laughs> um, just to say. Okay, so he had been in this wheelchair for a couple of years. He had not been able to walk. His toenails were really long and claw-like. He was hunched over. He had really bad acne. He wasn't seeing friends. He wasn't going to school. He wasn't eating very well. He had no life. Uh, One of the things his parents had decided recently to try for his pain were CBD gummies. Mm. And again, let me just say, all in. You've got a kid in a chair. Yeah. Nothing's working. I am all in. Let's try all the things. Yeah. Here's what happened with the CBD gummies. He would take a gummy and it would make him sleepy, a little foggy, and he would go take a nap on the couch. And when he woke up, no pain. What? And he would go for a walk and sometimes get on his bike and bike around and go to the corner store and pick up some candy and come home and hang out with his brother. And then it would wear off and we're back at ground zero. And this happened for a couple of weeks. And I was like, something very interesting is happening here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the parents said to me, "Um, we want to try an experiment with your support. We are wondering what would happen. And I know this is controversial. And I just want to say it was not my idea. We want to know what would happen. Do you know where I'm going with this out of curiosity? No. No idea. Oh, if we replaced his CBD gummies with regular gummy bears. Oh, wow. And I said... This is the experiment. Yeah. This cannot... I I cannot tell you to do this or to not do this. You are the parents and you are in charge. Right. Uh, However, if you do it, please let me know what happens. Because, wow, isn't that fascinating? Yeah, right. So going from treatment arm to placebo arm without telling patient, seeing what happens. And what happened? I'm on pins and needles. The next day, they gave him a cherry regular non-CBD gummy bear, just delicious cherry gummy bear. He got sleepy. He went for a nap on the couch. When he woke up, he had no pain. He went for a walk. He went for a bike ride. He went to the corner store. He bought some candy. He came back. And when it wore off, he could no longer walk and was back in his wheelchair. And we did that for about three weeks. And I think his parents eventually told him. Ah. And uh, the interesting thing was is It was that experiment that his parents decided to pull. And please don't get mad at me. This is like not my experiment. I did not suggest it. But people are like, that's so mean of parents to do to a kid. Listen, people tell, parents tell their children that Santa is real. So like (laughs) parents lie to kids all the time, just to say. So like, let's be careful with getting so angry about that. Um, Tooth fairies and everything. So I would- Plus this is a 26 year old. And I would much rather, right, right. But the the 26 year old adult child of these parents. And I would much rather lie- in a capacity that saves a kid's life or a a human adult's life than in a capacity where I'm lying about Santa Claus. So like, if we're going to, if we're going to be okay with white lies, like, let's go with this one. That's just my humble opinion. People will disagree with me and that's okay. Um, I was able to use that example in our clinical work as uh, evidence for him that pain lives in the brain, Mm. not in your feet, 
Mm-hmm. And that your brain is constantly trying to decide whether or not to make pain and to protect you based on all available information, whether or not I'm safe, what my body is doing, what my social environment is like, what my context is like. Uh, and because his brain before was under the impression it needed to protect him a lot, it was really amplifying pain. But now that there's medication in his system, his brain is calming down the pain alarm, which is exactly what the placebo effect uh is doing. It's turning down the pain alarm. It's turning down pain volume. That's what the gummy bear was doing. So so what happened after they told him that this thing was placebo? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He and I had been doing treatment together for a while. He actually knew the science behind it. Um, the answer is he got better. He stopped using any gummies and uh-huh. we did a whole protocol like pacing. There's, there's a lot of protocols that we use when we're trying to get a kid out of a wheelchair uh-huh. and to get their functioning back. Um, and wow. we did it together, and he got better, and he got out of the wheelchair and back to life, and he's okay now. Wow. And so I get Christmas cards from his family all the time. unbelievable. Yeah, it's amazing. So that little- And we inter- got him off all meds, by the way. That all inter- of them. Yeah. Okay, so there's, there's so. oh my God. I know, This I is know. one of those deals where I want to talk for 17 hours about every single point, but I won't because- no, we can't. Holy more questions. crap. I know. Uh yeah. So this is, this, okay. And his pain was real. Yeah, pain, oh no, no. 100% real. And it wasn't psychological. No, it was real pain. Yes. Like you said, pain Fabre. is this whole thing. He has thing. Fabre disease. It's real. Yeah, no, he has a thing. That's right. But because pain is this complex entity, yep. you were able to intervene in a way that was actually quite complex because Very complex. that intervention had biopsychosocial component to it. It sure did. It had, it had the expectation component, it had the chemical component, and then it had the social component of people saying, yeah, here you go, here's a very powerful Mom and treatment. dad. Mom and dad. Trust. Trust. From, yeah. Therapeutic relationship, you oh, might yeah. say, therapeutic alliance. Yeah. And all of that goes into making even a placebo incredibly powerful. Now, this actually has v- valid repercussions in the world of everything, yeah. because when you talk about COVID and people are like, I don't understand, I, I gave them ivermectin, I gave them hydroxychloroquine, they got better. Well, okay, how much of that is just luck, but how much of that is a real placebo effect? When someone thinks they're gonna die of a disease and you give them something that you're like, everyone who I give this to gets better. Suddenly the mind tamps down the cortisol levels. That cytokine storm never happens, that was gonna happen. The dry tinder gets moistened and it's not gonna catch on fire. This is real. That's why I'm really, you know, it's important to talk about randomized controlled trials and all of that. And I think that's very important, but it's important we also recognize placebos and understand that that can confound our understanding of science if we don't recognize the power of this and this and this and t- together and this together. So. Yep. If I were allowed, like I'm a big believer in medical ethics and yeah. I don't want to suggest, but if I were allowed oh, and yeah. I do understand the complexities here, yes, I would have a jar full of red. Obacalp. Placebo spelled backwards. Yes. Pills or red gummy bears, don't care, in my office. And I would say, this is a cure for your Fabre disease. Yeah. This is a cure for your chronic migraine. This is a cure. And I want you to take two of these a day. You're going to, here's what you're going to feel. You're going to start feeling a little bit better tomorrow, a little bit better. And then in two weeks, you're going to notice this big, sh- I, I just would make up a whole story around it. And if I were allowed, I would yeah. give every one of my kids a red gummy bear. Because And my adults too. <laughs> because your goal is not fidelity to truth. Your goal is fidelity to suffering. And that's a, right. that's a, that is a, as valid a goal as anything. In Except fact, I would lose my license and No, you fired. can't do it. You yeah. can't do it. But <laughs> right. that's why? the shit of it. I know that's the shit of it, isn't yeah, it? Because I've said it. that too. Like I, I, if I could prescribe placebo ethically, I would do it all day, every day yeah. for non-fatal You've diseases. Find... Even for diseases where we have no other treatment, it's like, yeah. well- here you go, yeah. and 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 it and it helps. Well, you know, so that that actually is a good segue, maybe into long COVID. Yeah. What do you think? You want to talk about long COVID, sure. just because we know so little about it, but it's a biopsychosocial condition. Yep. Um, please address long COVID and the ongoing fatigue that comes with it. How do people with long COVID recover and become more normal? Not wearing masks after being vaccinated, and the fear of getting it again, the trauma from having it, it's real. I went to urgent care over 10 times, had unexplained neurological issues from COVID. Could pathogens still be in my body? Could Epstein-Barr be activated from COVID? I'm doing healthy things that have dramatically helped in my recovery, including juicing, improving my diet, calming the vagus nerve, which has gone a long way in my healing. I wanna learn about CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy as well and how I might help me recover. Thanks for any insight, Claire, via Twitter. So so let's turn the mic over to you, Dr. Yes. Zubin, because, uh, I mean, I'll say why. I am 
watching you is how I've learned a lot. I mean, I read the news too, but watching you is how I've learned a lot about COVID. And I'm curious to know what your impression of long COVID is. Um, and are you hearing a lot of this? Yes, I am. And th this is what I, this is what I, the best I can formulate because the data on this is poor. Good to know. Even the criteria for discussing it are like, well, you have symptoms three months or longer, and then some people have symptoms six months and longer. And those symptoms may be something like smell loss, mm -hmm. which we know is a biomedical component mm -hmm. of COVID mm -hmm. because it affects the sustentacular support cells. The actual coronavirus can infect and destroy those or at least cause damage to them. And those we think now increasing data shows that that's probably the source of lack of smell and they take a while to regenerate and some people they may never regenerate. So, and that can be debilitating. So, so that being said, this long COVID scenario feels very similar to things like chronic Lyme, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, some components of fibromyalgia in that they are biopsychosocial. There is a social component, which is real. The media component, the social expectation, did you know one in five people will have long COVID? And, and again, I don't say this in a way to disparage even the media. It's just, this is the environment that people are in, the social component. We're social animals, we imprint on these things, we have expectations, so you have that. Then you have the psychological component, what she mentions in this, of the trauma, of the suffering. And that's why it seems like more severe cases of COVID are associated with a little more long COVID, but even minor cases can, develop into this. And then there's the biological component. So she's asking about, is it Epstein-Barr virus activation, which was the speculation too with chronic fatigue and other things. Epstein-Barr is a good punching bag for a lot of things because when it causes mono um, in many young people, it causes a lot of these symptoms that um, people have. And, and you know, one of the cardinal symptoms is actually sleep disturbance, brain fog, fatigue. Um, so the, and the brain fog component, the mental components of it, are very difficult to, to explain solely biologically, which is why the medical system struggles with it because we reduce it to the quadrant of it instead of including I, we, us, and it. Um, so that's my take is we don't know, but I will say this, I'm talking to a lot of smart doctors who take care of it, they will all tell me this is biopsychosocial. Oh, great. Yeah, they, they get it. They're oh, like, this is not easily explained with something that's a receptor or residual virus. And here's an interesting thing. Right. People who get vaccinated with long COVID anecdotally feel better. Hmm. Some people are actually cured. Huh. Now, why would that be? You could speculate a lot of biomedical stuff. Well, there's an immune response that there's residual virus and it really jazzes up the immune response, but I'm not compelled by that. Hmm. I'm compelled by the idea that we have a powerful therapeutic intervention that also has a biopsychosocial component, the vaccine. Yeah. And it is making them feel better on a multiple different levels. So that's my take on long COVID so far. Can you- if The suffering is real. Will you say on what le on the various levels that the vaccine makes people feel better? So what I think with the vaccine, and this is speculation- And this is really fascinating for me. It's speculation is that there is an expectation component that is even unconscious. So if you ask them, oh, did you think this vaccine was gonna make you better? They'll say, no, why would it? I'm just getting it because people tell me I don't wanna get reinfected. I've already had COVID. I don't wanna have it again. If I had these symptoms, again, I'd wanna really hurt myself. Yeah. It's not good. But on an unconscious level, there has been all the sort of media explanation that hey, these are very powerful medications. And in fact, even some of the false media expectation that there are all these terrible side effects that aren't really true, and there is the real side effect of myocarditis and all that, mm -hmm. make the intervention seem very powerful, mm. unconsciously. And I think that then generates a biopsychosocial field of whatever it is that we don't understand that then interacts with whatever's going on and makes things better. Wow. And what's interesting is it doesn't make it worse. We don't yeah. see people saying, I got worse after my vaccine. Right. Yeah, so there's something going on there. And I think if we could crack long COVID, then we would crack fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome and chronic Lyme disease and a lot of different things. Right. Um, agree that a lot of the things we're seeing with long COVID map onto a lot of what we see with a lot of chronic illnesses, mm. um, including the fatigue, uh, including the low mood, um, and what's interesting about COVID is I can't think of an illness that has been more politicized and um, 
villainized and there's so much shame. So I tested oh, yeah. positive for COVID right. a year and a half ago now. Weak, you're weak. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't socially distance and mask enough. It was worse than weak. It was like, you're a bad person. Yeah, exactly. That's you how- You didn't protect yourself and you didn't protect your loved ones. Right. And by the way, I did. I was in a pod of like two people. Yeah, exactly. Who, yeah, including That other person partner. was a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah, but no, none of, they didn't have it. No one yeah. else in my pod had it. I wore an N95 mask. Yeah, you might've had a false positive even. I think yeah. I did, but yeah. but not even to the point. Like uh, when I tested positive, I, the, the first emotion I remember feeling was shame, even mm. before fear. Like part mm. of me was like, I might die because that's what the news is telling me. Right. But but the biggest emotion I had was shame. Like yeah. I am shameful. I am dirty. I am like typhoid Mary. Ah. I I am ground zero for the vector. Pariah in my community. I am a pariah. High sphincter tone, you know, Bay Area. High sphincter. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a minute. Yeah, and I think that that has happened. So, so the illness has become stigmatized. Yes. Like if you have COVID, everyone wants away from you. They want nothing to do with you, and you're a person who has infected the school or infected right. the plane, or right. you you're a bad person. Like that's never happened with the flu. Right. It's never happened with any other illness that I can think of that has some contagion. Right. So, HIV. It did. That's yeah, true. HIV, HIV but that was you know that and that was a good lesson on that we didn't stigma learn. on we how to do public health uh, uh, interventions at work on you know et cetera. yeah we didn't yeah. learn that lesson no we should did not so so to your point people with long COVID are dealing with more than just the fallout of I had this virus rampaging through my system and it caused all these biological problems but also. There's the stigma, there's the shame, there's the depression, there's the fatigue, there's the I'm cut off from my social community, and what does that do to my health? Mm. Back to, you know, again, people who are isolated and lonely they and do alone. Worse. They do worse. Do worse. Yeah. Physically. You know, you can't engage in your hobbies. You're... So with chronic illnesses, one of the treatments, by the way, for every chronic illness is engaging in a pacing plan. What's that? Yeah. So for chronic pain, we have a chronic pacing for pain and fatigue plan. So what we do is when people have so much fatigue and exhaustion that they can't get out of bed and they lay in bed, as you know, for days and weeks and sometimes months at a time, guess what happens to your mood? Down the crapper. It crashes. Guess what happens to stress and anxiety when you've been missing out on life mm -hmm. And activities. Mm, through the roof. Through the roof. Stress and anxiety spikes. We know from all the research that when stress and anxiety spike and mood crashes and you become depressed, physically your prognosis is worse mm. and pain amplifies. Mm. That is the recipe. So that's the chronic pain recipe. It's the chronic fatigue recipe. The do nothing plan seems reasonable and because your body has been suffering makes a ton of sense. And the treatment is to get your life back a teeny, teeny, tiny bit at a time. So mm. pacing for a marathon. Have you ever run a marathon? Uh, eh, no. <laughs> the most I've ever run is like eight miles, and that was too much. That's a lot. Yeah, it was too much. I did a 5K over Halloween. It was yeah. really delightful, and I dressed as a monarch butterfly, which is why I have a butterfly costume. That's amazing. It really was amazing. We are going to get to the furry part of the show at some point. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> da -da -da -da. so so the pay, sorry pacing because you know the Thundercats pace themselves. They right. did. Snarf was the There's pace. There's a lot of pacing car. required. So so the way you pace for a marathon. I have never run a marathon, but I have run a 5K. I am not a runner, to be clear. I'm not an athlete, but I was like, let me see if I can do this thing. The way you pace is you do a little bit at a time. You figure out your baseline and your baseline is how much can I do today without any training? Like, mm. oh, I can walk for 10 minutes. That's it. That's what I can do. And that's great. And you take that number and you do it every day for a week. So mm. every day for a week, you go outside and you walk for 10 minutes in the sun. Now, for some people with long COVID or any other chronic illness, their baseline is probably lower. Maybe it's six minutes. For one of my kids who had had chronic pain for four years, it was standing on his front porch for 10 minutes in the sun. Wow. That, yeah. That's where we started. Guess what? That kid is the captain of the ultimate Frisbee team. Wow. That's right. Yeah. But where we started was, and that's a true story. Wow. And where we started was standing on your porch for 10 minutes in the sun. So pacing plans work and you have to figure out where you can start and then you add on a certain amount of minutes every day and it's very very important when put to get, putting together a pacing plan to have a goal 
And what I mean by a goal is it can be a functional goal, uh, like a thing you need to do, like I need to go grocery shopping, mm. function. It can be like a pleasurable activities goal, like I love ice skating, so I'm going to – or fudge making. I really just want to make fudge. <laughs> or it can be like, you know, I'm an athlete and I want to get back to running. So as long as you have a beloved – valued goal at the end of the line, your pacing plan is likely to be effective. Mm -hmm. So you start somewhere, you figure out what you can do today, you add on a few minutes. If it's fudge making, it's like, okay, I'm going to stand in the kitchen for 10 minutes, I'm going to buy a couple groceries. And, and you work your way back to life. But the do nothing plan is the opposite of what's effective. And that's what happens with long COVID and any chronic illness People is that we withdraw. languish. Yeah, we withdraw. We, with, we stop moving, yeah. we stop seeing friends, yeah. we stop going outside, and COVID is so stigmatized that like, of course, you know, of, yeah. cor of course. This makes, this makes perfect sense. Mm. The, the long COVID thing is right up your alley too, because this is exactly, you know, there's a biological component. And again, there's lots of research I think happening. There needs to be more. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is, we, in some way, we have as a society have made long COVID a thing and worse. Oh yeah. And I'm not saying it's created by that, but it is part of the dynamic in it. Because you know, there are these and we've I don't know if we've talked about this on previous shows, there are these precedents in Hong Kong and elsewhere that have been studied where a syndrome happens say to a young girl. It gets a lot of press and it's like maybe a fainting spell or something and suddenly there's a rash of fainting spells. It actually goes back to the copycat question in the school shootings, like why does that happen? Well, that we are social creatures and there's a social contagion that happens and suddenly there's a biopsychosocial interaction with the right substrate, the right situation, the right media, the right story, and suddenly everybody's having syncopal, they're passing out. So this does happen. It does happen. Yeah, it does I really happen. love the way you just described that. No formal training. Uh, Lots of formal training. You know what I have formal training in? Oh! Thundercats? That's right, I was waiting for that. I actually knew that was coming. You knew it was coming. Yeah, I did. Because you well, <laughs> you're Tomax and I'm Zaymot. <laughs> as long as I'm Tomax, I don't want to be the backwards name. No, Zaymot is too. You don't want <laughs> a confusing. name that starts with an X. Well, you might. I mean, I might because I start with a Z. Yeah, that's So I'm okay. pretty close as it is. I start with a Z too. That's true. We're the two Zs, pain points with Z and Z. Do you, should we do one more question? I don't know. Should we? I think so. We're almost coming on... We're going to close on an hour, uh, uh, two hours. Two think, hours? Yeah. We've been here two hours? Yes, we have. I crap you negative, lady. This is a real thing. Super. You know? Yeah. Two we hours? Actually, we actually covered some of this other stuff, emotions on kids. Uh, Dear Lord. I think what we'll do is we'll skip migraines this time. And yeah, we'll, no, skip. We talked a little bit about anxiety, but what I want to talk about is therapy. Because this okay, is let's an end action on that one. item. Yeah, let's you're a one. you're a therapist. I am. And um, therapist. Th yeah, that's right. I'll take the rapist for four hundred, Jack. <laughs> uh, the category is therapist. <laughs> um, did you ever see? I'm not even going to quote this. Just too much. Uh, it's, I know. It, it's, I know yeah, what you're Arrested say. Development. Yeah. I yes. Knew it! Yes. That's like my favorite. And, and, and it's my favorite. It is right. Is it too I won't say it, but I'll just say it might be too inappropriate. It's an, an, an analyst. And a therapist, he wanted to combine them together. And he did on his and business card. And that word and is a good word. And it was amazing. Yes. Um, so that was, that was Tobias, Tobias. wasn't it? Tobias. Tobias Funke. Yeah, <laughs> so such good. a good show. Um, therapy. I had a terrible experience in therapy a few years ago, and I didn't feel like my therapist helped me at all. It made me want to give up on therapy together. Should I quit and find someone else or just quit for good? Maybe therapy isn't for me. How do you find a good therapist? How do you even know if therapy is helping? Mike D. You know what I love about Mike D? He's also a Beastie Boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Yes! We did it. Tomax and Zaymot for the win. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I saw Mike D and I was like, this is a sign from God because the Beastie Boys have now called in. It's uh, licensed to ill. <laughs> <laughs> you're a New York girl. No, I am a New York girl. How can you not love the Beastie Boys? How can you not love the Beastie Boys? Okay. Okay. <laughs> the most important thing to say, and I'm going to ask your, your opinion about this also. Oh, no. Even mm -hmm. though. You're not a therapist. That's right. I'm um, an analrapist. Careful. I said it. it. See, oh, it man. was the Tobias. That was from Arrested Development. Yeah, that was. Okay. Yes. Um, going to one therapist and having a bad experience and then deciding that therapy is bad mm. or not for you is, in my mind, the equivalent of going out to dinner and eating a bad meal and deciding that food is bad. Mm. That is not true. People have bad experiences all the time. And I don't mean to be mean, but there's a lot of bad therapists out there. There are also a lot of good therapists who are just not the right fit for you. 
I am not the right fit for everyone. I have a very distinct personality. <laughs> and, you know, I am the right fit for some people, and I am not the right fit for other people. And that is okay. Well, you know, it doesn't help that you start every therapy session with uh, – uh, chant with me, ancient spirits of evil, transform this decayed body what? into Mamra, <laughs> the ever living. Sorry, I do not Thundercats. start any of my episodes oh. or sessions that way. <laughs> Back to you. So, yeah, so you're not a fit for everyone. You have to find that right therapist. That's the personality. Keep, keep, keep going. Well, just generally speaking, yeah. when you go shopping, do you try on a couple pairs of shoes before you buy a pair? No way, dude. I try on like 25. And then I asked the guy, I was like, so I have a little bit of a, a valgus deformation of my foot. What do you recommend? And it's like foot locker. And he's like, bro, I don't even know half the words you just said. Try these eye tops. Yeah, here, why are you not wearing socks? <laughs> try these Air Jordans. Oh, Air Jordans. Nice. Exactly. I'm like, if I can't pump it up, it's not a real shoe, man. It's not a real shoe. Oh my God, that's how I the, feel. You know what I it. rolled with when I was a kid? <laughs> no. Talk about being bullied. I had the Pro Wings, which were the palest shoe stores, <laughs> Velcro strap <gasps> shoe. I'm so jealous. And I was like, what, sixth grade? And the kids were like, you got those, dog? Those cost $10. I'm like, yeah, but they're so comfortable. And then it would just, it just rip. Oh. Yeah, my poor mom. She didn't know. Man, this just got dark. Yeah, it got dark. <laughs> Anyways, back to, <laughs> speaking of dark, bad therapists. <laughs> No, back to shoes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> back to shoes. You're talking about different shoes. You try how many shoes do you try on? Sure. Right. So you try on 72 pairs and you ask very important medical questions. Most of us go in and try on like, I don't know, five or six pairs, and then you get a pair that fits you, yeah? That's just for your feet. Right. If you're trying to figure out shit with your brain, mm. don't you think it's worthwhile to try on a couple of therapists to find the one that fits your brain the best? Mm. Like, if you're going to try on 25 pairs of shoes, give yourself permission to go out there and try on a couple of different therapists and see which one feels right to you. That is my humble recommendation for everybody. Everyone needs a therapist. I really believe that. I have a friend who said, gosh... All of these people spend so much time talking about their physical health and how many miles they biked on Strava and how many miles they rode and, you know, how many hours they did yoga. But, and, but imagine what the world would be like if all of us were like, yeah, man, I worked on my shit in therapy today for two hours. Mm. And just how different the world would be if we talked about our mental health and our emotional health as much as we talked about our physical health. Yes, that's why, honestly, that's why I brag a lot about how much I meditate. It's not bragging. It's like, guys, I do this. I take this very seriously because self-improvement, self-knowledge, self-introspection yeah. is important yeah. in general, but it's important to me and Definitely. I want to model it. I want to virtue signal it. I'm like, guys, let me show you. Mindfulness and meditation are a very important part of someone's well-being and health. And I will say, therapy is a different animal. Yes, it is. And to this person's question... Um, how do you know if it's even helping? Sometimes th I'm just going to say this, even though maybe it will turn some people away. It doesn't always feel good and it's not supposed to. Yes. It's not supposed to. Like eating vegetables when you're a kid also isn't delicious, but it's really good for you. It helps your body grow. It helps you become really big and strong. And the same is true with therapy. Like if you actually want to evolve, sometimes that requires Child. looking at things that are painful about your past or about yourself and moving through it. Like changing patterns sometimes is not like the most fun, comfortable thing. But if you have a good therapist, it's pretty awesome. Yes. I'm going to triple down on that and say it, it, pushing yourself into some discomfort is almost a requisite for real growth in this way. It's not If it's all unicorn farts and whatever, it, it's very unlikely, I think, that you're gonna find, in a way, you're almost going in a confirmation bias kind of thing. Because some people do, they seek out therapists that just kind of validate them or- That's not real therapy in my it, mind. Ah, a yes man, yeah. a yes man is very nice. Yeah. I know a lot of people who see yes men therapists, including family members, and yes. nothing changes. They nothing just, changes. They just get the yes. A, 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 yeah, oh, well, you know, your feelings are completely valid and Every, you shouldn't do anything. Everyone in your family is crazy except yeah, for you. Except for you, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So we have seen that even in, in, yes, I have very close people that have had those experiences. That's not. That, that's not. So it, it becomes difficult because you have to f try to find that right person, but it's not necessarily their right that they make you feel so good. That's right. Right. That's right. No, but, and, and like, just to say, support is great. Having like an advocate, yeah. very important. Yeah. But if your therapist isn't calling you out gently, yeah. kindly, yeah. supportively on things where you could use some help, yeah. then therapy in my mind 
might not be happening. Yeah, it's it's more like a friend that's telling you what you want to hear. And I know those friends and I love those friends and I call them because I need them to say nice things to me and to just say yes. <laughs> exactly. But that's not therapy. That's not therapy. That's important. Yeah. That's so, something people don't yeah. really dive yeah. into. So, yeah. so I really believe that everyone could benefit from having a therapist to support them. Uh, insurance is broken, mm. but most people have sufficient ins- insurance coverage that they can get some sessions covered. Yeah. And you're allowed to poke around and find a therapist that you think fits your unique brain. Just yeah. like you should find a shoe that fits your unique foot, even if it's a pump up Air Jordan with Velcro. Which insurance glitter. does not cover. No, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. I tried. Z. Dude, we did a thing. This was rad. This was fully radical. I'll so spell that word out. I'll put it out to five digits like pie. Amazing. It's all the pie I know. We should tell people how to send us more questions. Yes. How will they send us more questions? Um, you can email me through my website, yep. zdogmd.com. Scroll to the bottom. There's a contact form. Twitter's best for me. Twitter is good for you. And I'm put at Dr. Zoffness on Twitter. Is that right? At Dr. Zoffness? Uh, I yes, think that's right. that is correct. And what I would say is you put in, if you, if you message me, put in hashtag pain points or Rachel Zoffness, and I will look at it in a certain way and forward it to you. Yep. And our our process is, I take a look, I go, oh, interesting, I forward it to you, you then go, ah, and then we create a thing and we do a thing and we're gonna do it regularly because it's a thing. It's Pain a thing. points, I like that name actually. Yeah. And if people don't like it, they can deal with it, okay? ZZ Doc was taken by no one ever because it's dumb. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of funny. I like that too. ZZ Doc. Yeah. I feel like I should grow a beard and have a sort of omens mm. that we're going to sign out with. Oh. That's right. Let's do it together. Guys, I love you. If you love pain points with Dr. Z and Dr. Z, share the show. <laughs> Become a supporter. Go to zdogmd.com forward slash supporters and you can pay for all this. And I will even throw a couple bucks Rachel's way by buying her a meal mostly raisin bran because I find it to be a high fiber treat <laughs> that is also very high in sugar. Um, and uh, thunder, 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 thundercats. Ho! Ho. <laughs> and we're out. 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 <laughs>